welcome to Katie Draws. If you've been here before, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am Katie. <laughs> I tend to do a lot of speed painting around these parts, and I like to draw, in particular, goddesses and heroines, and this spans from all across the globe. I do like to specialize, I say specialize, I like to focus on goddesses that are a little more obscure, just ones that we haven't really talked about, or especially in the United States, goddesses that are very unfamiliar to us. Not to say I won't try other ones, but I also like to share information about these goddesses so that you and I together will learn about all of the amazing creatures, goddesses, females, amazing things in the entire world. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Tibetan Buddhist goddess. Her name, I believe, and my pronunciations might be off because I don't speak the language and I'm having a very hard time finding the right pronunciations, uh, but her name is Chopin Drinzangma, I believe. She is the third out of five Syringma or long life sisters. Syringma is actually a reference to the last of the god or of the goddesses that I will be talking about in the set of five. So she is kind of like the biggest one. So I wanted to save her for last. But today we are going to spotlight Chopin or Chopin, and we are also going to be talking about because it's such a lengthy five parter. We're going to focus on the Dharma Pala and the Bun or Bon religion. The Bon religion is the indigenous Tibetan indigenous people's religion. Allegedly, it may even be older than Tibetan Buddhism. And it's actually kind of a great example. Um, I'm going to present both of these together because it's kind of an, a great example of religious assimilation, being able to see how we can connect two kind of different religious perceptions and mesh them into one. And in a lot of cases, at least in Western society, we've seen that many times before. It's not a f unknown concept to humanity, but we see it a lot and it's usually used as a way to convert people. And I think this is a great example of kind of showcasing them together, but it actually works more harmoniously. So I'm really excited for this. Sit back and let's learn about this awesome stuff, Tibetan Buddhist religion, the Bon religion, Dharma Palas, and of course the goddess Shapen Dra Zingma. On our previous video, we talked about Tibetan Buddhism and Buddhism in general and the practices. Now, I am going to try to dissect a few things about the Bun religion and briefly talk about Dharma Palas. Bun is commonly considered to be the indigenous religious tradition of Tibet. From a Westerner perspective, it can be viewed as a system of shamanistic and animistic practices performed by priests called Kshen or Bonpo or Bunpo. But we have some issues here and it has to do with language and history. In early records, quote Bun denotes a particular priest who performed rituals that had to do with the afterlife and leading the dead to safe haven. We briefly talked about this just now. It is only much later, under the influence of Buddhism, that the word bun comes to designate pre-Buddhist Tibetan religious practices in general. What also needs to be pointed out is that rituals and practices pre-Tibetan Buddhism concerning the Bun were much different than the modern day quote Bun religion. Simply, we are using the same word Bun 
to describe two separate things within the same vein. And we're interchanging the terms so it can be incredibly confusing. A reason for most of the confusion is that many of the local Tibetan indigenous people never had an organized religion before Buddhism. Therefore, saying Bun religion is, mis is misleading. In addition, many of their traditions were passed down via word of mouth. There is no written tradition for evidence of the existence of what we know of Bun today, pre-10th century. And again, it is separate from what we know of today as the Bun religion. The contemporary Bun is essentially derivative of Tibetan Buddhism. I will explore more of this confusion and debate in the following video when we talk about the history of ancient Tibet because this is very important. So I want to actually just talk about the practices of the indigenous Tibetan people before Buddhism. I'm going to just call it the pre-Tibetan Buddhist religion to make it less confusing. I might say Bunpo, but I'll try to make this less confusing. The original features of indigenous beliefs pre-Buddhism in Tibet seem to have largely been magic related. There were a lot of rituals, blood sacrifices, demons, and spirits that were associated with earth, sky, etc. These spirits are believed to inhabit all areas of the country. Most of the people relied on magic and ritual to bring simple benefits to their houses or village. Keep in mind, the environment of Tibet can be very harsh. It's very cold, dry. It's not necessarily the most giving place in the world environmentally. Some of the things the indigenous people wished for was protection from harm, good crops, healthy livestock, health, wealth, and everything that most of us want. Every part of the natural environment is believed to be alive with various types of sentient forces who live in mountains, trees, rivers, and lakes, fields, sky, all of the earth. There is also evidence that each region has its own native supernatural beings associated with it and people living in these areas are strongly aware of their presence. In order to stay in their good graces, Tibetans give them offerings, perform rituals, and sometimes refrain from going to particular places so as to avoid the more dangerous forces. The pre-Buddhist religion of Tibet gives the impression of being preoccupied with the continuation of life beyond death. There were elaborate rituals for ensuring that the soul of a dead person was guided safely to the afterlife. This was a land of bliss, and this was done by an appropriate animal, usually a yak, a horse, or a sheep, which was sacrificed in the course of the funerary rites. Offering a food, drink, and precious objects likewise accompanied the dead. These rites reached their highest level of elaboration and magnificence in connection with the death of a king or a high nobleman. This is very similar to practices in ancient China. Enormous funerary mounds were erected and a large number of priests and court officials were involved in the rites, and they lasted for several years sometimes. There are allegedly two purposes for this. One is to ensure the happiness of the deceased in the afterlife, and on the other hand, to obtain their beneficial influence for the welfare and fertility of the living. But I want to go back to the spirits and demons, though. For some indigenous folk in Tibet, 
the spirits were divided into different categories. And this is going to get a little complicated. So, the world has three parts, sky and heavens, then we have the earth, and then we have the lower regions. And I think that's something that all of us can understand and get behind. Now, each of these has its own distinctive spirits, many of which influence the world of humans. Here is where things get a little muddy, and there are divisions among experts and how they label everything and what they rule over, but there are commonalities overall. So from my understanding, we have four large categories. We had the Nian, Lu, Sadak, and Sun. Lu is a spirit that lives in water there before the Buddhists came. Uh, it's basically a Naga culture. Lu is always down below the surface of earth or in water, opposed to Nian, which lived in the mountains. Commonly, women worshipped Lu, and Lu were more female-oriented spirits, and then men worshipped Nian, and they were more masculine-oriented spirits. Sadak is lord of the earth, but it's not really well known. Sen lived in the rocks or underground. All of these spirits have negative associations. For instance, the Lu spirits or Naga, which we talked about in the last episode briefly, apparently they bring leprosy to humans and they should be kept at bay. I'm unsure if this is the original pre-Buddhist belief system behind these spirits or if this is from more of a Buddhist influence over time. I have linked a really cool video down below of a professor explaining all of the bun spirits in more detail. He does more justice than I do. These spirits and demons were assimilated into Tibetan Buddhist lore over time and I will get into this into in a moment. Something else to note, you will find a lot of overlap between pre-Buddhist Tibet folklore and the foundations of the Sherpa's belief system. For instance, both the Sherpas and the indigenous people of Tibet pre-Buddhism believed in the Lu spirits. Not only that, there is a lot of Taoist influences when it comes to the nature of the world and the yin and yang or black and white. And I'm sure you can see that when I mention the Lu and the Nian. In its earlier forms, the Bun Po doctrine was a dualistic theism, teaching that the creation of the world was brought about by coexistent good and evil principles. But the philosophy of the modern is generally in accord with Buddhist non-theistic tenets. So very, very different. In pre-Buddhist Bun belief, there are many other types of demons and spirits. The folk religion is a rich and varied system with a large pantheon, elaborate rituals and ceremonies, local shamans with special powers who can exercise and divinatory practices that allow humans to predict the influences of the spirit world and take appropriate measures. All of these are now infused with Buddhist influences and ideas, but retain elements of the pre-Buddhist culture. When Buddhism entered Tibet, there were vast differences in the local belief system and Buddhism. Some texts allege that Buddhism did not attempt to suppress belief in the indigenous forces. And again, all of these texts, writings from Buddhist practitioners, monks, etc. Rather, it incorporated them into its worldview, making them protectors of the Dharma who were converted by tantric adepts like Padmasambhava, who we've talked about on each video. He's also known as Guru Rinpoche. So now all of these spirits now watch over Buddhism and fight against its enemies. So this is where things also shift and we see the Bun religion created. So 
Contemporary Bun Ritual includes worship, iconography, and meditation on peaceful and wrathful deities, just like Tibetan Buddhism. In addition to peaceful and wrathful deities, the bun distinguishes between enlightened deities and those who are still, quote, of this world, or not fully enlightened. There are four principal peaceful deities known as the four transcendent lords. These are led by a goddess, Yum, the mother, followed by three male deities in, and that's contemporary Bun religion, not pre-Tibetan Buddhist. In Buddhism, these are called Dharmapalas, and Dharmapalas are all over the world. They don't just reside in Tibet, but a lot do. In Tibetan Buddhism, many of these worldly protector deities are indigenous Tibetan deities, mountain gods, demons, spirits, or ghosts that have been subjected by Guru Rinpoche or other adepts like Milarepa and are oath bound to protect a monastery they might be they might be bound to protect a region a place or a particular tradition or as guardians of buddhism in general and that does include the saringma sisters the dharmapalas typically appear as wrathful deities with crazy features that would line up with what we would think as demonic Though they do appear really freaky, it is a reminder for us to relinquish earthly fears and desires in order to gain enlightenment. The Dharmapala's violent characteristics symbolize inner transformation and the determination needed to overcome the obstacles within the self to achieve Buddhism's compassionate practice that renounces harmful thoughts and actions against other living beings. So typically practitioners meditate in front of these figures and they concentrate on transforming all of that violent energy into something more creative and necessary to transcend the human ego or to transcend fear of death to ultimately achieve enlightenment. Dharmapalas are meant to be our teachers even though we see them as really scary, they are there to teach us how to transform negative into positive energy. Dharmapalas aren't gods in the way that Westerners see gods. Many of them are still not enlightened or have reached nirvana. The Syringma sisters, or the Long Life sisters, are not depicted as demonic, but they were still vowed to protect Dharma by Milarepa and Padmam Sambhava. Thus, from my understanding, that makes them Dharmapalas, if not a lower tier of Dharmapala. This goddess, Chaupin Drinzangma, she is red in color. She's holding a treasure chest in the right hand and a wish-fulfilling jewel in the left. She's riding a hornless stag. She is the long-life sister who grants wishes. She makes everything auspicious and brings authority in all things. She repels all ill effects of bad omens and bad dreams and gathers auspicious conditions for good things to ripen. She is an expert on removing obstacles related to bad timing based on bad dates and negative planetary alignments. If you're ever deciding to launch your own business or product, or even if you're planning a wedding or if you're planning on having a child, display her together with her four other sisters because she brings really amazing good luck and guards the Western location. Overall, here is my unprofessional hot take of this whole thing. I'd like to clarify, I am not a scholar or a practitioner of Buddhism or the Bun. 
but history is typically written by the winners. And unfortunately, we don't have written texts from pre-Tibetan Buddhist indigenous cultures. We can only allude what we can based on the writings from Buddhist texts and what has been passed down over time. And the people who did practice, or the Bunpos, some of those priests from pre-Tibetan Buddhist times, they were hunted down. That is a fact and that is in history, which we will go over later. So unfortunately, we can only assume what pre-Tibetan Buddhist religions looked like and what the indigenous people practiced just by seeing tools and objects that archaeologists ha may have dug up or past accounts from people that might be practicing modern day bone religion but there's a lot of things there and we can only read what we have it's a little complicated right i mean Especially as a Westerner, we have the Dharmapalas, which are gods, but they're not the traditional ones that we have been necessarily exposed to. At least the purposes are not the same. Not only that, they're technically not really gods either, because Buddhism doesn't really believe in gods. It's not polytheistic whatsoever. But then you combine those aspects of the Bun religion which is more of an animist perspective versus a polytheistic. So there's a lot of really cool aspects here. And we will, for sure, in future videos, probably months, hopefully not years from now, we will be diving into more Tibetan Buddhist lore and probably more about the Dharmapalas because there's plenty of them to actually cover. But I wanted to kind of give a nice brief overview of spiritualism and just kind of like what that means and what Buddhism means and what that looks like in Tibet and also incorporate the Bon religion. But now we are going to talk more about the history because this is really important. Not only that, this is the, that is literally the most complicated part about this whole thing and it still is today there's still a lot of controversy about tibet so again i am not a professional i am not a scholar of tibet or history whatsoever i will be presenting two separate ideas maybe more than that and trying to give everybody a bit of an overview of kind of the history of tibet as it relates to our goddesses as well i also want to touch on the sherpas because they're very important and they also believe in the Syringma sisters, especially Mio Lang Sangma, who was the first one we did. But we we definitely want to cover the Sherpas because the Syringma sisters are goddesses of basically the Himalayas. So stay tuned. Next in ne in the next two weeks. Oh goodness, I'm trying to overwork myself. We're gonna be doing the next goddess. So the fourth goddess. We're almost there. Uh, and her name is a bit of a mouthful, so I apologize ahead of time. Her name is Tingyi Shao Zhangma. Yes, I am going over and looking over because I keep forgetting it, and it's just a tongue twister for me. But it's Tingyi Tingyi Shao Zhangma. So I'm really looking forward to her. I think she's got a really cool aesthetic. And I'm also looking forward to exploring and learning a lot more about Tibetan history. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Uh, if you guys like this stuff, make sure to subscribe on your way out. Also make sure to comment and like, it really helps the algorithm and also spread the word. I want to create a great community of people that love mythology and goddesses. And I kind of want to try to present a more female perspective on these goddesses too. Uh, so, but also if you like my art, make sure to check me out on Instagram and also my website. I will hopefully start selling things soon. Uh, I will make time for that eventually. 
I also have a TikTok that I've got going on and Facebook. All of that is at Katie Draws. You can find me. You can find me everywhere. Uh, make sure to uh, subscribe again and stay tuned for two more Wednesdays, you guys. And we will talk about the next Tibetan goddess from the Syringma sisters. And I will see you next time. <laughs>